Hi guys, my name is Ben Guilford. I'm the owner of The Fire Brick Company and in this video we're going to show you how to install the dome of your precast oven kit. Our floor tiles have all set, uh, so guys make sure you give your floor tiles at least 12 hours to set in place before you move on with the rest of the project. If you try and do it any sooner than that, you may find uh, that the floor tiles move around on you when you're trying to place the castings, they're quite heavy. Uh, and so you really want to make sure that you're not pushing the floor tiles around when you land those. So if you leave it for 12 hours, you're going to come back and that mortar is going to be set nice and hard and you're going to be able to lay the castings without anything moving around on you. Uh, one thing we do want to do is before we, we move on, we want to make sure that we grind down any sort of high spots. Any, when I say high spots, we grind down any raised tiles that are going to catch our pizza peel when we're moving you know, pizzas in and out of the oven. We don't want bricks that are sitting up uh, for us to slam the, the edge of the pizza peel into. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's very difficult to lay these perfectly flat. Uh, so you will find that you will have some little raised edges. I know I've got a few here. So I'm just gonna go around with my angle grinder. You can use a flap disc, you could use a masonry grinding disc. You don't need anything very aggressive uh, because you're not gonna be taking off very much material at all. You're just gonna be knocking down just that edge. Okay, so don't grind off any more of the brick than you absolutely have to. Okay, uh, you don't need to like grind the whole surface. That's, in fact, I definitely don't recommend you do that. Um, only grind down that ra the raised edges that you really need to. So since we are gonna be grinding our fire bricks, we wanna make sure you're wearing all the right safety gear. So make sure you're wearing safety glasses, some gloves, some hearing protection, but also make sure you're wearing a dust mask because when you grind fire bricks, it's actually very similar to grinding concrete in a way. Uh, in that it's releasing respirable silica, which is uh, something we don't really want to breathe in. So make sure you're wearing your mask uh, and protecting those beautiful lungs of yours. So I've ground down all those uh, little high spots that were gonna catch my pizza peel, but I've really made sure that I didn't grind enough any more than I need to. The, the fire bricks actually have a pressed surface. Uh, and so the surface of the brick is actually a little bit harder than the internals of it. So we want to try to minimize the amount of grinding that we're doing so we're not exposing the, the um, uh, internal section of the brick, which is not, don't, don't have the same wearing capacity that the press surface does. Uh, all right, so the other thing you might be thinking of is, well, Ben, you've got some gaps in between the bricks. And so if I wanted to, I could fill those in with mortar if I really wanted to, to be honest. You don't really need to. Uh, they're gonna fill in with ash anyway. As you use the oven, they'll just fill up with a little bit of ash. So it's really neither here nor there, whether you fill them or not. Um, I'm not gonna bother. Uh, but if you want to, go crazy. Now we're gonna set out our castings. So the dome of the precast oven is made up of four precast sections that we make uh, here at our Melbourne facility. Uh, and to start with, we're gonna be laying the front, then we will be laying the three shell sections that make up the dome around the back. Uh, so to set out the, uh, the front, sort of the entry arch casting as we call it, uh, then we need to measure a line back from the front edge of our tiles. We're gonna measure back and we're gonna just draw a line across here using gray lead pencil, which of course is gonna come off over time. Uh, so the casting is going to land behind this line uh, and what we're going to find is that there's actually going to be a gap from the outside edge of the casting to the outside edge of the bricks. Uh, and we've, we've done that quite intentionally uh, so that there's, there's plenty of room to, to land the, the casting. So you're not coming down right on the edge of the brick. Um, but there's also a little bit of tolerance there as well. So if you do manage to set it off a little bit to the left or the right, it's not going to matter. All right, um, but basically when you land it, the key thing is just to get it as centered as you can. You can use a ruler if you really want to and sort of measure uh, the gap on each side, get it exactly right. Um, but for me, um, I, I like to just eyeball it uh, because in the end it doesn't make a huge difference. install the 
dome of the precast oven. And this is actually one of the sort of the quickest processes. Uh, if you compare it particularly to say the brick oven, building the dome of the precast oven is incredibly fast. Uh, and that's one of the advantages of the precast oven over the brick oven is just the ease and speed of construction when it comes to actually putting it all together. Uh, when you're doing your castings, when you're laying your castings, you want to do them all at the same time. Uh, so make sure you're organized. So you're going to need a few things in order to do it. Obviously, you need the castings. Uh, so make sure you have those near to hand. You're really going to need someone else to help you. Uh, this, this part in particular is quite heavy. It's definitely a two-man job. It's, it's not, not for one person to do by themselves. Uh, and you will need a few tools. Uh, so obviously you need a tub and a trowel uh, for your refractory mortar. Uh, you're gonna need a rubber or dead blow mallet. Um, these, are, these are fantastic. We're actually gonna be using this to just move the castings around a little bit and get them to lock into each other because they have a special tongue and groove joint uh, in between them and we want all of those to nest in as tightly as possible. You're not gonna be putting any mortar in the tongue and groove joint. All right, I'll repeat that. No mortar inside the joint. It's not designed to have any mortar in it. What we're gonna be doing is mortaring over the outside. We're basically gonna be creating a big seam or bandage of this refractory mortar mixture over the join to seal the two sections together. The idea behind that design is so that we don't get any degradation of the mortar over time. Let's say we had some mortar in this joint. Because it's not uh, a tapered joint, it'd be a sort of a parallel joint, uh, in 20 years time, if that mortar deteriorated a little bit, you may find some of it falling out of the joint into your food, which we don't want. So there's no mortar in this joint. It's only on the outside, so we're never ever gonna have any kind of issue with that. You're also gonna want a small ratchet strap. They're also called tie-down straps. They're probably called something different everywhere in the world, um, but they all have one of these ratcheting mechanisms. You don't need a particularly large ratchet strap. In fact, I prefer you use a relatively small strap that doesn't have a huge um, sort of load limit on it. The reason being, we're gonna be running the ratchet strap around the perimeter of all the castings. Once they all landed up on our stand or on our floor tiles, we're actually gonna use the ratchet strap to pull them all into each other. And if you use a really big strap, then you could really get a lot of tension on there and potentially damage uh, one of the castings. So uh, go for something relatively small, um, but you'll definitely want to have one of these. You'll also want uh, some gloves. I'm going to be using my heavy duty washing up gloves uh, because I'm going to be handling the mortar, but I'm also going to be handling these parts. Now we make these here in our Melbourne factory, uh, and this is refractory castable mixed with stainless steel needles. The stainless steel needles are there, uh, they're also called fibres, stainless steel fibres. They're there in the mixture to give it tensile strength. Uh, so there's actually quite a lot of stainless steel fibres in this mix. And when we pour it, uh, we vibrate the, the castings, as you can see from all these little bubbles on the outer surface. Um, and you may find, in fact you probably will find, that fibres can come to the surface, particularly on the exposed corners. So when you're picking it up, uh, you really want to be wearing some good strong gloves so that you don't get, uh, you know, like a needle in your hand effectively. Uh, it's not that much fun and I've experienced that several times. Um, now back on, actually on these voids, I do like to point this out. So as I said, we, we cast these ourselves. Uh, we have our own custom made fiberglass molds that we've developed ourselves. Uh, and you're gonna find on the outside of the castings, they almost look like the surface of the moon, you know, lots of these voids and this, this sort of weird sort of texture to them. And that's because when we vibrate the refractory castable, the bubbles in the castable come to the surface and some of them get stuck on the surface of the, the underside of the mold uh, and then they set there. Now, guys, you're never gonna see this surface. The surface that you will see is on the inside and you find that's gonna be beautifully smooth. All right, uh, so just be aware of that. I like to point that out. Um, on the outside, these things look pretty hideous, but on the, the surfaces that matter, you're gonna find that they're nice and smooth. Uh, so the other things you're gonna need for uh, set, landing, particularly this front casting, is you're gonna want a car jack. You're also going to want your formwork. 
Uh, we're going to use, you could also use a, a square, um, but I'm using the formwork as right angle because we want to make sure that when we land this, that we have approximately a, a right angle here. It doesn't have to be p perfect, um, but you want to try and adjust it so that it, the casting isn't leaning forward or back. It, because of the, the shape of it, it will have a tendency to want to tilt back on you uh, when you land it on the mortar mixture. And so we want to have that jack there so that we can actually wind it up and use that to get to get this, this front face to be vertical uh, to our floor tiles. All right, uh, so we're gonna mix up some of our refractory mortar and we're gonna get into it. So remember, get help. Don't do this by yourself. Wear all your safety gear, particularly your gloves. Uh, and um, yeah, this is, this is one of the fun parts. Right, once you've laid your floor tiles, you are done with the air set refractory mortar. You can take that bag, set it aside. You no longer need it for the rest of the build. From this point onwards, all your bricks are gonna be laid using our two part mortar mix. Uh, we have part A, so you'll see refractory mortar, part A. This uh, material in here is a fairly fine, um, uh, dry material. It does have a small aggregate, about one, one and a half millimeters across. Uh, so don't confuse that with refractory castable. The castable has a much larger aggregate. So when you get them in your hands, you'll know them pretty well straight away. Um, but so refractory mortar, part A uh, is, um, just a, a fairly fine material with a, a fine aggregate through it. And then we have part B. Now the mix ratio is on the bags, so we're gonna take three parts of part A with one part of part B, and that's by volume. So you could use a cup, for example. So you get three cups of part A with one cup of part B. Part B is cement fondue. Uh, this is refractory cement as designed in France. This particular product's made in the UK. It's very, very good quality. And you combine these two together and you've made an incredibly strong mortar. Uh, it will go off in about an hour. You'll find it's actually setting quite firm. Uh, within four hours, it's getting sort of, it's quite it's hard. And, within two, and after 12 hours, it's rock hard. What that means for you is thinking about cleaning. Uh, so really, I really want to encourage you to clean as you go. Uh, remove excess mortar uh, as you're laying your bricks. So when you're building around your formwork at the front, um, once you get your, your vertical sides up, pull the formwork out and make sure you've cleaned off any of that excess mortar that's bled out in between the joints. Um, give that all a clean before you do your vent arch because you can remove that formwork without interfering with those bricks. It should just slide out, give everything a clean and then get it back in there and land your vent arch. Um, as long as, it, I think, hopefully you're getting the message. As long as you're thinking, right, this stuff sets fairly quickly, it sets really hard, uh, then that will sort of inform your uh, your building process. Uh, so all you need to do is add water and you're gonna mix it up. Now, you don't need to mix up a great deal. Please don't mix up a whole heap of it. There is a little bit of extra mortar in the kit, okay? We don't give you the exact right amount. We always give you more than you need, just in case you waste some, but please make sure you don't waste any needlessly. All right, um, and the consistency, you're looking for a fairly thick mix and again, that key is you should be able to put it on the trowel, hold it upside down, and it'll hang on there. Uh, now, important things to note, you need to soak all of the surfaces that you want to bond together, need to be soaked in water before you apply the mortar. The idea of that is to make sure that the mortar gets a really good bond with those surfaces. If you try to apply this mixture to a dry brick, for example, you will find that while it may look like it bonds initially, as it starts to set, it will get dried out by the brick. The brick will absorb some of the water from the mortar 
and cause it to debond. And that's not something that we want. So make sure uh, that when you're using this mortar, you have wet down all your surfaces really thoroughly and you have uh, soaked all of your fire bricks, particularly when you're laying your fire bricks, make sure that you've soaked all of those in water for at least 10 minutes to allow the water to fully soak into the brick. One of the things that I want to point out about this refractory mortar is that it's what's called thixotropic, which is a very long and nerdy sort of word. But basically, it means that this material, if you let it sit and it remains static for a few minutes, it starts to sort of stiffen. It, it becomes, it looks like it's going off. It looks like it's setting. So you might have, you know, mixed up some of your mortar and then you go and you get your castings, for example, get them, you know, move them over and you go to grab the mortar and you're like, oh my goodness, it's firm in, in the tub. It's, oh dear, it's already set. And, um, that's not usually the case unless you're working in extremely high temperatures, which can cause the mortar to set quite rapidly. What it is, is the mix is thixotropic. So it means when it sits there for a bit, it sort of starts to look like it's, it's hard. Don't be tempted to add any water to the mix, okay? Once you've got your, your mortar all mixed up properly, you know, so you've got the right consistency to it, that's it. No, you don't add any more water after that point because you will weaken the mortar significantly if you do that. What you can do though is you can just mix it again because when the material is thixotropic, when you vibrate it or mix it up, it starts to flow again, as I'll now demonstrate. Um, so you can see this mix here sort of looking quite, looking a little bit hard back here. It's like, oh no, is that has that started to set? But if I just get my trowel, you can see now it's wet and soft again. And that's just the nature of this mortar, is it's thixotropic. So please don't panic if you're come to use some of your mortar and you think, oh, it's, it's gotten a bit sort of stodgy. Um, if you just give it a really brisk mix with a trowel uh, or your mixing drill if you're using one, um, mix it up again and you'll find it will go back to that nice smooth consistency that you want. All right, so we're about to start landing our castings. And like I said before, uh, when we're using the refractory mortar mixture, we wanna make sure that we soak all of the surfaces that we're trying to bond together. So if we're laying castings onto our fire brick tiles, which is what we're about to do, uh, we need to soak the tiles and we need to soak the base of the castings. Uh, so when I'm um, with, with fire bricks, they're very, very porous. Uh, so if they're loose, uh, like you saw before, when we laid the fire bricks, we soak them in water before we laid them. But you might have laid your fire brick floor a week ago and now it's bone dry. Uh, now we can't, obviously we can't put it back in a tub and soak it again. So what we do is we actually pour water onto it uh, and let that soak in. Uh, and I'll usually do three or four pours of water over the top. You could use a hose if you want. Uh, we just want to saturate those bricks uh, so that we get a really good bond between the casting and the, the tile. Uh, with the castings themselves, spraying water on them. Um, th 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 it doesn't work all that well. These are not as porous as the fire brick. So I'll just use a nice wet cloth and really just soak that surface and I'll let that absorb for 30 seconds or so and then I'll do it again. Uh, and so, so that I've just got a little bit of moisture in the surface here so that the mortar doesn't uh, try and debond from that surface. All right, so we're gonna land our front casting and we're just gonna put down some mortar in the area that it's gonna land. All right, and so we'll just put a bit out. If you look at the shape of the base, you'll be able to see roughly where you're gonna need mortar. Again, I'm just gonna put on more than I really need and then we'll, we'll remove what we don't.
while we have the opportunity, I'm just gonna get my trowel and just remove the excess. We don't wanna waste this stuff. All right, that's our front casting landed. So we, we checked that it's following the front line, which it is. Uh, I'm gonna remove all of this. We've also got it sitting square using our jack at the back. Um, and so now we're ready to get our shells on. So put down a nice bed of mortar. You can put it down fairly thick uh, and the weight of the casting is gonna push it out. Now be aware that the floor tiles are actually designed to be slightly bigger than the outside circumference of the castings by about 10 millimeters all the way around. So when you're landing the castings, uh, you're not trying to line them up with the outside edge uh, of the floor tiles. You're gonna be inset from that by about 10 mil. Now, I haven't tried to move things around too much yet. We're gonna get them all on and then we'll move them all together. All right. Now I'm deliberately making sure that there's no mortar in this joint because then it makes it harder to get the tongue and groove joints to lock in. Now we're actually gonna leave this sitting out a little bit because to get the last one in, we have to sort of open up the the shell sections to get the third piece in. Okay, so we got them in, but the gaps are probably a little bit irregular. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is get our strap I'm going to run it around the perimeter about three inches up, two or three inches up from the base so that it pulls in around the base, pulls all the pieces together. We'll go around and knock it with a dead low mallet. How long did that take us? Five minutes. Five minutes. Ten, like, even ten minutes. You know, it's, it's a really quick process when you compare it to building the brick oven. Mm. Oh my goodness, the brick oven's like two or three days to build the dome. <laughs> you can do this in minutes, uh, which is kind of cool. So, all right, let's get this going. So, we've got some tension on our strap. Now, we can get our dead blow mallet and go around and tap, because uh, I can see here, you know, this side is sitting out a little bit, and we could probably tap that in a little. What we're looking for in the end is, on the inside, we want to see nice, tight, Joints, as tight as we can get. Usually within five millimeters will be absolutely fine. But ideally we just get them as, as close as we can together so when we look inside the oven, we see this nice tight joint. Now, honestly, we could leave it as it is now and it would be fine, but uh, it's nice having uh, nice tight joints if we can get. So we've tapped them all together as tightly as we can, uh, so we can take our ratchet strap off. Okay, like that. Uh, and we can also remove our jack that was holding the front section level because now our castings, our shell sections are in behind it and they're gonna support it. All right, so we've knocked all the sections together. We've taken out the jack, we've taken out uh, the strap, and you can see we've got quite a bit of mortar that's squeezed out from underneath them because we put down a pretty excessive amount uh, when we landed them. So we'll get all of that out now with the trowel uh, and just make sure we fill in the joint along the inside. If, if there's any gaps between the, the floor and the casting, we can fill those in now. Once you've removed the excess mortar, get in there with a nice wet sponge or scourer and scrub the castings and floor tiles clean as the mortar will set fairly hard in around 12 hours and it'll be quite difficult to remove thereafter. As soon as you've got your castings up, uh, you can actually put in your fiberglass dome uh, and it's a really simple process. Get that car jack that you were using before and you're just going to use the car jack to prop the dome up under this void here 
uh, and that's going to provide our seal so that we can pour that keystone. Okay, so you're going to find that uh, the joints will come together quite tightly, but you may find that one of your joints doesn't necessarily want to go together like, you know, perfectly. Please don't worry about that, okay? Then the design of these is very robust. Uh, we don't actually need these to be completely butted up perfectly against each other. Uh, they're they're going to hold up regardless. Okay, uh, so you'll find um, even if you don't have a perfectly tight joint on the outside face, if you look on the inside face, you find the joints are really nice and neat. Okay, so please don't panic if your joints are a little wider uh, on the outside. Um, you can see here, we've got a good, you know, probably a good six mil up here, and that's not a problem. Right, so now you've got your castings all bedded down in the refractory mortar mix. Uh, it's now time to pour the keystone. Uh, so we have our fiberglass dome in place and what we want to do now is we want to prepare to do both the keystone and the bandages at the same time. It's not a very long process, it's actually quite quick. Uh, so if you get yourself organized, you can do both of those steps in one sitting, if you will. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to soak the castings with water so that the castable and the mortar that we're going to apply to them bonds really well. Uh, so you'll just want some water uh, and a scourer, uh, maybe a sponge, and I'll show you why. The concept here is we want to make sure that all the surfaces are going to bond well with the refractory materials that are about to apply to them. Uh, so what we'll start off with is just a scourer. You could also use a wire brush. We just want to just scrub the surface that we're going to apply the mortar and castable to just to make sure there's no loose material on that surface. So I'm going to scrub down the inside surfaces of the keystone up the top here. I'm also going to scrub these sections here just to either side of the joins so that I make sure those surfaces are nice and clean. Okay, so we've got the joints all cleaned, everything's cleaned and scrubbed, and now we want to go over it just with a, a sponge or a cloth or a towel or just something that you can get nice and wet and really get some water into the surfaces. Castable fire bricks are naturally porous materials, so they'll tend to soak up water quite regularly. So I'm just going to go over these surfaces two or three times with a really wet uh, in this case, I've got a wet rag, uh, and just get some water into those. Um, please don't worry about like, oh no, I'm getting, I'm getting water into my, the bottom of my oven. Or th you can, you can hose it down if you really want to. Um, that won't, won't hurt anything. Uh, but I'm going to be using uh, a rag. Uh, but if you had a, a garden hose with a trigger, you could just gently spray these joints as well. That, that would be fine. What we're trying to do is just really get a bit of water into this surface so we get a good bond with the refractory materials that we're about to apply. So for your keystone of your precast oven, you're gonna be pouring it with refractory castable. Uh, refractory castable is the exact same material that we've used to make these pieces. Uh, so it's the perfect material to fill the void at the top. Uh, so you've got a plastic bag of refractory castable in your kit. Uh, now, I'm gonna show you how to mix that up and just a couple of tips for mixing it. Number one, there is more than enough castable in here to pour the keystone. So don't mix it all up at once. Don't put all of the dry mix into your tub and add water. I'd recommend putting in maybe two thirds, so keep a third in reserve, uh, and then start adding water to the dry material nice and slowly. Add a little water, mix it up with your trowel. If it still obviously needs water, add a tiny bit of water, mix it with the trowel. It's quite a different material to the refractory mortar. The refractory mortar uh, is not very sensitive to water. You can, you know, you can add a little bit extra water and it won't turn into a runny soup, but the castable will. Okay, the castable is quite a high-tech material and it's, uh, it's, it's still quite sensitive to 
water addition. So it wants sort of just the right amount of water. And what that means is you want to just add your water nice and slowly and mix it up into that thick porridge consistency that we're after. Again, we want it almost to hang on the trowel. Um, you may find castable is not particularly sticky, uh, so it doesn't tend to really hang on the trowel all that well, uh, but we'll show you exactly the consistency that you're after. The reason why we recommend you don't put all of the dry castable into your tub to mix up is if you do happen to add too much water to the mix and turn it into a bit of a soup, well then you won't be able to fix that. Uh, but if you leave some in reserve and you happen to make your mix a little bit too wet, you can add a little bit of dry material just to thicken it up a bit. Okay, so we've got our castable all mixed up. So remember, if you're wearing gloves, which you should be, uh, you can use your hands, get in there and work it with your hands. You don't just have to use the trowel. Uh, and that was actually a really good example of why we don't recommend putting all the dry mix in at the start, because castable can look like it's really, really dry. Uh, and you mix it and go, wow, it's so dry. And you add just that tiny little bit of extra water and it shifts into a quite a runny mix. So um, yeah, just don't be tempted to add lots and lots of water, just be really patient, just a tiny bit at a time, because we're only mixing up a very small quantity of castable. So I've got a nice, thick mix, uh, and so that's gonna fill that keystone just perfectly. Okay, before we fill the, uh, the keystone here with the castable, just give it a little wipe just to make sure there's no water left on the fiberglass, because um, that might leave little marks in the castable. Uh, and now the, the, the fiberglass is actually made in a polished mold, so it's got a lovely smooth surface. Um, but if you want to be really fussy, you can wipe that surface down just with a little bit of vegetable oil, a very light film of oil. Just make sure you don't get any on the castings itself. Um, but you don't actually need to do that because the fiberglass has a really good surface. Uh, so castable, just like the refractory mortar, is a thixotropic material, which means if you let it sort of sit by itself, it looks solid. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere, but if you mix it or vibrate it, it will flow and become more liquid, which is what we can do now. We get our trowel and just, just poke it. And just, you can see how it's behaving like a liquid, it's flowing. So what it's gonna do is all the little bubbles that are in this castable will now come to the surface, which makes this a, a stronger material. And that's what you see here on our castings. We vibrate these castings uh, with industrial shakers, and that's why you have these little bubbles here. So we wanna make sure we vibrate this. Okay. And so now we have filled that, and that's our keystone done. Uh, and I've still got a little bit left over here and I've actually still got some dry material in the bag so you can see there's plenty in your kit. We've got our keystone poured. Uh, now we're just gonna wet these gaps down one more time just to make sure we've got them nice and damp uh, before we put our mortar bandage on. All right, so for this step, you need to mix up some mortar. Remember, mix small amounts of the mortar. Okay, um, if you're a professional, you're a you know, landscaper or a professional oven builder, uh, you'll mix up a reasonable amount at a time and you'll do a whole lot, you know, while it's still wet. Um, but if it's your first time building one of these, and we recommend just mix small amounts. You can always mix more, just you can't unmix it once you mix it. Uh, and so if you end up wasting a lot of it by letting it go off in the bucket, um, then you might run out. There is more than enough in the kit, but just 
Just mix what you think you're going to use in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so we've got our cling wrap uh, and we're going to make a bandage of refractory mortar over this joint to seal it. Now, don't try and get it perfect with the trowel, right? That's really hard. Um, what you're gonna do is use the glad wrap, and I'll show you how. Now, we're aiming for a thickness of about 15 to 20 millimeters over the whole joint. Right. So I've got my bandage there, but it's pretty ugly. And I'm not sure that it's really stuck onto that surface well. So I get my glad wrap. Just peel some of this off. This is just straight out of the kitchen. And I'm just gonna put that over this, up to here, tear that off. And then I can use the glad wrap to spread it out. All right, now this does two things. It, it allows me to push the mortar around, get it where I want it, push it nice and hard against the castings, so I know I'm getting a really good bond. But it also acts to prevent dehydration of the mortar. Um, the mortar and the castable are similar in that they're both what's called hydraulic setting materials. Uh, so that means they don't dry out they consume water in a chemical reaction that goes on inside the material. So the water that we added to the mortar is actually converted into a whole bunch of other crazy chemicals, which we won't go into. Um, but basically, that mortar is consumed, and that's what gives the, uh, the mortar and the castable its strength. So we don't want it to dry out, we want it to cure. So we want to stop the water from escaping, and that's what this glad wrap's doing for us. Okay, so we've got our keystone poured and our four gaps here all nicely bandaged up. Uh, and we've run the, the glad wrap sort of up to the end of the mortar, um, but we also want to uh, cover the castable so that it gets to cure rather than dry out. Uh, so once you've done your, your bandages, uh, then cover the keystone as well with some glad wrap.